started because uh, time always seems to run out in these seminars. Um, so I'm uh, really excited to be able to introduce Andrea Lucky today as uh, this week's seminar speaker. Um, I met Andrea back in 2008 when she was a PhD student with Phil Ward studying ANSI somatics. Since then, she um, did a postdoc at NC State with Rob Dunn and about two years ago accepted a position at the University of Florida in the Department of Entomology and Ecology there. Um, and she's an evolutionary biologist who's interested in ants. Um, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Coming from Phil's lab. Um, uh, biodiversity, and um, she's also got this really uh, huge interest in citizen science, um, which is what she's going to be speaking about today. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is that given that um, Andrew's position is a, a research and teaching position, I wanted to uh, make a special note that uh, this past year she taught a distance learning course, which I think more and more universities are, are picking up. And, uh, and so I just wanted to mention that because I think she's got a lot of neat experiences that we can tap into. So, if yeah. anybody does want to talk about the online education and that whole movement, I have lots of opinions about it, and now I also have uh, some small amount of experience, and it looks like at least my university is going to that direction. So we have to do Thank you. It's really, really an honor to come back to a place where uh, a lot of my inspirations came from because while I was doing my PhD, I thought a lot about the fact that, that I'd be able to do so much more work if I only had minions. If I had a whole network of small people, I didn't have to be small people, but if I had a whole network of individuals who could help me with my field work, which was fairly international, and so it involved a lot of travel, and also involved a lot of time spent on the ground looking for ants, and some other people that I know right now, my children, um, other people's children are also very good at collecting ants, so this is not rocket science, but it does, it is the beginning step, and this is sort of the pavement in my title of this talk, Pavement Ants to Population Genetics. In order for me to do a lot of the work that I did for my PhD, which had to do with um, molecular phylogenetics and systematics, I had to actually get out there and collect the ants. Now, I say I had to get out there, but that's probably one of the most joyful parts of the work that I did, and a lot of you probably have an experience where your field work or the active part of the science is something that you really love to do. Um, and then it integrates with the other aspects, the data analysis and the big picture thinking. And in the process of thinking about how I would do my own work, I did spend quite a lot of time thinking about how we teach science. I taught in this classroom um, a, a freshman seminar that I lovingly titled Bugs and Movies um, for four semesters. And I interacted with a lot of freshmen who are not at all interested in entomology. and um, it was a great learning experience for me about how people do learn about something that they're not necessarily pursuing themselves. And I'll talk about this today in the context of citizen science and the way that we learn science and how actually getting citizens involved, non-scientists, is very useful to us as scientists, to the science itself, and how it progresses, and um, why this is something of interest to you, I would encourage you to pursue it. Okay, so I'll start out talking about citizen science with a bit of a historical perspective, but then I'll just quickly move on to the benefits and challenges, because I think this is what people are most interested in learning about right now. And I'll give some examples in the context of two projects that, that I run and that I'm actively working on right now, which are the School of Ants and Backyard Beetles. And then I'll talk a little bit about the future. So just to, so we can all start on the same page, if we want to broadly define citizen science, we're talking about organized scientific endeavors that include participation from professional scientists and the public. So your chemistry class in high school is not citizen science. You have citizens involved in doing some kind of science, but it's not that end goal of actually producing research. And people like to quibble about different definitions of this term, but I think it's also important to recognize that part of the citizen science that is critically important to the non-scientists is the experience of doing science and that experience of putting on your hat that says, I'm a scientist. Most of us have a hard time remembering a time when we weren't fascinated by science or excited by science or felt that science was important, but I fortunately have family members and friends that are not scientists, and they remind me all the time that what I'm talking about is boring, and <laughs> what I'm doing is boring, and um, if I could somehow liven it up or make some connection with them, they would be willing to listen to 
So it's challenging, but it's also very useful. And this is currently my experience with undergraduates and even some graduate students, that part of the important element in the citizen science that I do and also the science communication that I do is finding ways to connect people who aren't already at the table excited. It's about getting other people connected. So another term for citizen science is public participation in scientific research. And you might hear this term um, scattered about. So just to go back in history a little bit, science wasn't always something that people did as their paid job. There weren't these vast institutions where anybody could participate as a student. In fact, historically, a lot of the scientists were people who had means and were able to go out and do the science, or had other jobs, did other things, and were able to contribute to science by simply observing, writing up their results. Um, and in some cases, like in the case of Maria Sibylla Marion, who you might recognize from STEM, so there have been some really interesting exhibits going around botanical gardens. She was a woman scientist in the 1600s, hundreds, who wasn't really known as being a scientist. She was a botanical illustrator. She went to Suriname. But what's interesting to me is that early on in her life, she was observing insects and plants in a way that a lot of us are very familiar with. She drew pictures. She watched what was happening. And in fact, from the published records of her personal journals and her writings, we know that she actually observed metamorphosis, complete metamorphosis, in the silkworm 10 years prior to its publication in any literature. Now, we know that she's not the first person ever to have seen this. Lots of people, probably farmers and other people who interacted with insects, knew about the idea of complete metamorphosis, but it was not published. Now, if she had been a 13-year-old who was out there publishing her paper, she would be docu have, would have been the first person to have documented this in the scientific literature. And I, I'm really interested in this idea because there are lots of people around us who are non-scientists who are making observations that are potentially very useful to us in our quests for understanding processes and patterns out there in nature. So the citizen science you might be familiar with, or a lot of people are familiar with, are things like the North American Breeding Bird Survey, where people out, go out and observe birds. They identify them by ear, by sight. They contribute to these vast databases. And when you think about all these people out there who are interested in watching birds, it makes for an incredibly wonderful data set in some ways because so many people just have an interest in birds. Now, these kind of citizen science projects are very appealing when they involve charismatic organisms like birds. There are lots of birders out there already. They tap into a pre-existing interest. What happens when you switch over to organisms like insects? Well, you've narrowed your focus. You have a smaller subset of people who want to go out and collect insects, perhaps. But I'll tell you that even though ladybugs are some of the most charismatic organisms that we have out there in the insect world, there are a lot of people who participate and so when I was starting to get involved in ant-based citizen science, I wondered what kind of interest I'd have from the general public. Because I know that my target audience might look like this, does look like this, many generations older as well. Lots of people are aware of ants, and some of them are interested in ants. But I also realized that we're not talking about people philosophically looking out at the world, taking a walk in the woods. We're talking about people who live in environments like this. I mean, this is the face of science as it's happening in classrooms. Our science education is happening in places that more resemble this than resemble vast wildernesses where people can make observations about nature in a pristine setting. So if we're going to talk about science and people learning about science from a young age, we really have to think about this new changing context of how people are experiencing their world. So, once I started getting interested in the idea of building a citizen science project, I really wanted to make it something that people could do in urban settings. If we think about how the world is becoming more urban, we have some numbers we could throw around, like by 2030, the number of urban dwellers will have exploded to 4.8 billion people. That's 60% of the projected world population, very different from in the past. So in these urban environments, we can imagine the world as a series of urban places, which is contained within these circles, most urban places in the world, where everybody has their own private space. Now, if I want to do a survey event in a national park, I need to go get permits, but I can do it, and I usually have a vast area to go survey. If I would like to go in your neighborhood, I would have to lock on a, knock on a lot of doors and ask for a lot of individual permissions to go in their backyard and collect ants. If I make a project where I say, please collect ants in your backyard and send them to me, I avoid the permitting process altogether, but I can potentially survey much larger tracts of the world that are unsurveyed, because in a lot of urban areas, we've changed the landscape so much, so rapidly, that we don't know what kind of wildlife is living there. We might know this on a large scale level, but when we're talking about the insects, 
How many of you actually know about the insects that live in your yard? Who has a species list for their yard? I'll raise my hand because I admit we do have a species list for our yard. But even if you don't have a complete list, it's probably something you've kept track of. And I think there's a lot of personal motivation out there to learn what, is, what are the animals or organisms living around you. And this is part of what citizen science is actually tapping into. What lives near me? So, we might go out and collect lots of different field guides so we can identify the things in our yards. But if people are really interested in this field guide to my own backyard, if that personal motivation is there, which I think it is for quite a lot of people, then automatically that means that there's something to work with. So I'll start out formalizing a little bit some of the benefits of citizen science. Because if you haven't understood already, I am a proponent of this being a great way to both benefit the science as well as benefit the people. And some of the benefits include getting many samples if you want a really large data set. This might be a good way to do it. You can't collect all the samples on your own. If you have such a large scope to your project, you might want to actually go out and cover the globe. This might be something that would be worth doing. If you want broad participation, if you'd like people to be able to participate from any sector of, uh, of the country, any, any county, not necessarily just areas that are close to a university where they might have personal contact with you, this is something that could be beneficial. So raise your hand if you have projects that might benefit from something that would for example, reduce the intensity, the labor intensity of what you're doing. This is where the minions come in, right? Um, if you're in a field situation where you have lots of travel time to get there, would it be beneficial to you to have people right there on site actually doing collections? If you need to do things that are somewhat repetitive, like taking quantitative measurements, or observe over long periods of time, this is something that can be very useful to have people actually out there. So one of the things that you have also have to ask if this is something that could potentially be useful to you is can you make protocols that are well designed enough and easy to learn that the variability of results is not going to affect your outcomes in a negative way? So things like spatial, broad spatial and temporal extents. I think internet accessibility is kind of a no-brainer at this point. If you're gonna, if we wouldn't be having this conversation right now if we didn't have the internet to essentially broadcast these projects and run them. And then um, one of the things about a lot of these projects that makes them really exciting is that people can do them on their own, and then they become gateways for learning more information or for getting more involved in other ways. So you have this broad participation, and then maybe more narrow, more specific participation later on. Okay, so those are some benefits that often bring people into citizen science. But I'm also gonna spend a little bit of time talking about challenges. And I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm down on citizen science, but I did spend some time reading through the literature, thinking about, okay, what can go wrong? Got all these people interested in collecting ants. Who's gonna mess, up with, mess with my data? Well, some of my participations are goofy by nature. Uh, some of my participants are, and they're, they're just going to be. I'm gonna be working with a lot of kids who are collecting ants. They're gonna stick their gum in the collection bag. I mean, I have to think about ways to prevent this from gumming up the works, so to speak. And probably more importantly, Large-scale projects often involve multiple collaborations with multiple scientists, and it's probably easier working with goofy, um, over-sugared kids than it is working with a bunch of different scientists who have very specific ideas about how they want things to run. So the challenge that, challenges that come up are often organizational with citizen science, and how to organize the participants, or at least guide them towards participating in ways that, that are useful, but also um, the organizational aspects that involve collaborating with scientists. Just as a side note, um, I put up this picture of a scientist because I found out from my students that this is what a scientist is. It's somebody in a lab coat with gloves, with Perlmeyer flasks, flasks full of colored liquids. So um, this is sort of the idea that, that I'm working with, the base idea of what does science mean. And I'll come back to talking about this in a minute because I do interact with my students um, in classes in, a, in, a, in ways to understand how can we change perceptions of science that make it a little bit more either appealing or trustworthy for people who are not necessarily drawn to the sciences. Okay, so organizational difficulties, aspects of data collection that give some people pause before they would delve into actually collecting data that they might not feel comfortable using. Data management, once you have those data, can you use them in the way you want to or share them the way you want to? And then also for the participants, especially the educational aspects, um, what is the experience that people go through when 
going to talk about these two projects that I run. One's called the School of Ants, the other one's called Backyard Bark Fields. And when I mentioned before that there are these projects out there that you might have experienced with uh, these charismatic you know, vertebrates or macro insects, um, you know, ants are, are a great group to work with. And I'll talk about bark fields in a minute. But starting out with the organizational aspects, so a survey of literature brought up all of these topics as, as challenges to citizen science. Why people don't get involved, why the projects are stymied. And these three, I think, are all fairly easy to understand. Lack of public interest, limited funding, and limited scientist-non-scientist -scientist interaction. Now, not to dismiss them as unimportant, but limited funding is something that we all encounter. Um, any kind of projects that we like to do in the sciences, we, we find that funding is a limiting factor. But right now, there's more support through NSF for citizen science or outreach projects than there ever has been before. And arguably, NSF has helped fund this whole movement towards public outreach because of their broader impact requirements. And most of the projects that I work on, these two included, are NSF-funded projects based on the research that have citizen science built in this broader impact component. Now, of course, I'd love to see more funding coming in to do this specifically this type of stuff, but I would say that right now limited funding is um, it's a fact, but it's also a fact that we also all have to deal with in terms of running our research. Public interest, I think, is a matter of perspective. Um, raise your hands if you have ants in your yard. You should all be raising your hands right now. I don't if you live around here, it's true. Um, most people do, and so public interest, you know, most people aren't going to go out hunting for a project on ants. Most people do have a personal connection with these organisms. They're aware of them. It gets a little bit more complicated when we have citizen science projects based on organisms that people don't necessarily know exist, but it's possible. And then the limited scientist-non-scientist -scientist interaction, I think that this is something that can be overcome because of the changing face of the way we do science outreach. In the past, science outreach used to mean people physically going places, to classrooms, to fairs, places where people could meet a scientist. I think turning this whole story on its head and allowing people who participate to be the scientist and give them the tools and the context and the opportunity to do that um, seems to be working quite well. So that's what I'll be talking about a bit. Okay, so these two projects have shared goals, scientific goals and educational goals. And really for both of them, at their very most basic level, they're projects that are mapping projects. Finding these organisms where they live, and if we all do a little bit of collecting in lots of places around, around the country, we can get a really great map, a map better than any that exists currently for where these organisms occur. And it can give us a baseline for measuring change in, in, in regards to invasive species, and the ranges, urbanization, things like climate change. And then as a side, um, there's also a lot of opportunity for discovery. Now, if you're in an entomology department, you know that discovering new insects is not necessarily the most earth-shaking thing. But it's true, there are a lot of insects out there that don't yet have names. But if you talk to people who are non-scientists, I think the freshness of that type of discovery is very powerful. This organism does not have a name. It has never been described by science. I still get chills thinking of it. It's new. We've never encountered it before. We don't know what it does, or we do know what it does, but it doesn't have any. Very powerful. And so that really leads into the educational aspect of things. Um, offering the public opportunities to engage in doing science. What does the scientist do? It's not just swirling the chemicals in the class. Science happens. It's a process. It's discovery. It's observation. It's very exciting. But people don't often get an opportunity to do it in a way that leads to something. And a lot of communities might have great science teaching in their schools, but they might be far away from museums or universities, so they might not see science in practice. And so this is where, again, having everything based online where people can participate wherever they are is really important to me. And then ultimately making all the stages of the scientific process accessible. If visible is enough for somebody just to see it happening, that's great. But ultimately with these projects, I would like to have people involved, whether in classrooms or individual participants, really participating in everything all the way through publication, data analysis, hypothesis development. Okay, so let me give you a brief introduction to the School of Ants. Five easy steps. So, start over here on the left. You need some cookies and some index cards and a plastic bag. You put those cookies on some index cards in a green space and a page space. You wait an hour, the ants come, you collect your ants, you stick them in the freezer overnight, and then the next day, you send them to me. Any questions? <laughs> what kind of cookies? Pecan sandies. They like the nuts. 
very basic idea. This is actually drawn from the myrmecological community. This is a tried and true technique. Anybody want to have any comments up here about whether this works or not? We know that this is not going to collect all ants, but it's pretty good. If you drop some crumbs on the ground, most places, if it's warm enough, some ants will come. You can collect them, send them in. It's not too complicated. And I won't go into a lot of the details about how well this program is run, other than to say that at first I wasn't certain whether people would want to participate. But within the first two weeks of having opened up the website, done a couple of pre press releases to let people know that it existed, we had two, two, we had 10,000 requests to participate. And we had to shut down the website with a little sign up that said, we'll be back soon, in order to revamp our protocol because we used to send out collection kits. And we were not able to do that with that volume of interest. So um, the answer is yes, it works. And then after about a year and a half, it seemed like it was a good time to tally results. What were we getting? And I was really interested to see that, you know, a year and a half, and across the country, we had people sending in over 100 species. Now, just as a pilot experiment to see if this would go and what would come out of it, I was quite shocked to see that we got that level of response. You know, people collecting things in their yards. And then even more when we broke it down into native versus introduced species, we're not just talking about a bunch of trash in urban areas. Pigeons and rats is what we joked, or that's what we're going to be getting, pigeons and rats. And you know, amongst these five species here, some of them are introduced, and some of them are native. But this is not a list of bad ants that we all want to get rid of. Well, maybe fire ants, but you know, that's, that is just in the South. So there's a lot going on with these ants. In fact, one of these species here, we know very little about. We know that it's everywhere, at least where, within its range, but we don't know a lot about its behavior. And this one I'll talk about a little bit more, the Pomerium cestinum. It's really interesting. It's a complex of at least seven species. It's never really been called invasive, but as far as I can tell, it's a silent invader. It's very quietly moving along in all these places that we make that it's very comfortable living in, which is sidewalks or pavement, a habitat that doesn't naturally occur in a lot of places. So one other result that I'd like to share about this project that gave me a lot of confidence that this is something that not only were people interested in participating in, but could potentially have very powerful results. One of the species that we found, Pachycondyla chinensis, was a known introduced species in the southeast. And it was thought to be introduced somewhere around 1930, was thought to be relatively harmless, didn't do much, non-invasive, until recently a PhD student actually found that not only was it very invasive, it was invasive in mature hardwood forests where it essentially excluded all other members of the ant communities. But then through this project, we found two new sites where this ant occurred. One was in Wisconsin, one was in Washington State. And so it suddenly became of, of interest as an invasive species with a 2,000 mile range extension. And so we ended up having this conversation with county extension agents in Washington wanting us to put them in contact with the people who found this. Well, finding that eight-year-old boy was interesting because, of course, we had to go through his parents. And it was just a very interesting process that the county extension agents wanted to be in touch to find out more. The family wasn't sure that they wanted. They, it was a cool discovery, but they weren't sure that they necessarily wanted to be um, having stories in the newspaper about this kid. A lot of interesting issues with publicity. But ultimately, um, that was a valuable discovery. And it was done because somebody put some cookies down on the ground and sent them into us. What we hope is that this could be a monitoring approach. It's fairly low budget, high interest, and helps curtail population extensions of either known or new invasive species. Okay, does anybody recognize what this is what's going on here? So this is, um, it's probably not grass, this is probably just sawdust. So these are ambrosia beetles. You are probably familiar with bark beetles around here. And ambrosia beetles actually are going deep into this branch here, digging their tunnels. They're pushing the sawdust out behind them. I like to call these sawdust noodles. Um, but what's basically going on here is that in people's yards, in your yards possibly, in most places, these are very common insects, but people don't notice them because they're not looking for these sawdust noodles. But if you were to crack open that branch, what you might see is this whole family arrangement here with a beetle, her galleries, her larvae developing in there. Fascinating world. 
but it's really hard to find them because most of them are under about two millimeters long. But one way to find them is to attract them. And we know that they're attracted to ethanol because ethanol smells like a freshly dead tree. You can open a beer, have a glass of wine, and that gnat that you're waving away is very likely to be a bar for ambrosia beetle, um, ambrosia beetle specifically for this group. Now, we knew that we couldn't build a project that involved sending ethanol across the country in little packets and asking children to play with it responsibly. But we do know some other products that actually have a lot of ethanol in them. In fact, hand sanitizer has a fairly high proportion of ethanol in it. So we did some trials and we realized that this makes a great attractant. So if you take a fairly complex protocol like cut a window out of a bottle, put this attractant in there, use it as a trap, um, this is basically what happens. You have beetles flying around, landing in the hand sanitizer, getting stuck in it, and, um, and you trap them. So if you could do that, be providing some interesting support to this early detection rapid response program that is a, a forest service program which does things like detect ambrosia beetles that are potentially dangerous for the avocado industry or for other fruit tree industries. It's essentially a great program but it doesn't have broad enough coverage. So again this is where citizen science can come in and be very useful for monitoring hopefully prevention. So in talking a little bit about the organization, how do we build these programs and projects to be simple enough for people to, to follow and for us to be um, comfortable with the results, we also have to think about issues of data collection. And I would say that this is the area where most scientists get a little bit nervous about participating in citizen science because we all care so much about our data quality that we're unwilling to hand off our protocols to someone who we don't trust is capable of following them to the degree of, of specificity that we're comfortable so it's true, there's a lot of variability in data. And if you're a non-expert, you might not do as precise a job as somebody who's trained. And it's true that non-experts, when asked to measure abundances, do a poor job of that sometimes. Um, and if you're asking people to do identifications at the species level, we actually have a fair amount of evidence that people are not great at, at identifying organisms at species level if they don't have proper identification tools. And so one of the approaches to dealing with that is don't ask them to do things that they can't do. Make a project that asks people to do things that they are able to do, and then provide them with other tools if they would like to learn how to do identifications, but don't base your data set on that. So the way that we approached that with participation was, again, back to the simple protocol. If we could do a simple protocol, well, we're, what we were asking people to do was essentially collect organisms and send them to us for the identification. We're asking people to provide organisms <coughs> and addresses. And we hope that people can do that all right. And for the most part, we think they are. So the part of, of our project that I think is also pretty interesting is that we collaborate with taxonomists. So I'm not identifying all the ants myself. I'm sending them off to experts who are doing a great job of identifying some of these, some people in this room. Um, and it allows me to work with people in different regions who have regional expertise. So I've already talked about how these are inexpensive materials, anybody get them, but when people participate, they can participate in multiple different stages, so they're comfortable at each step of, of the process. Now, when, when I say that we shouldn't ask people to do things that we're not comfortable assuming that they can do, we went ahead and tried some effectiveness trials with our protocols to make sure that they did actually work. And so, when it came to this bark beetle project, we wanted to know how important was trap design and this idea of hand sanitizer as an attractant. So the first thing that we did this is my master student, Sidonia Steininger. She looked at some traps that have been used um, within the bark and ambrosia beetle community, and there are a couple of different designs. Most of them are relatively similar, one window, two window, spray painted or not. But really what we found was that there was no significant difference in the catch from any of these different type of traps. So these traps were effective, and there wasn't one that was better than the other one, so a simple trap with a single window cut out was enough. When it came to attractants, we included a couple of other things in our trials, but none of them worked as well as ethanol, 95% ethanol, and then high ethanol hand sanitizer. So Purell, the highest, 73%, and then Germex is pretty good, coming in at 60-some percent. Now, there was a significant difference, actually, in the results that we got with these, basically, according to the amount of ethanol. 
But what was interesting was that the purifier was right behind the ethanol. And when we did enough samples, our species accumulation curves all more or less ended up in the same place. So the diversity that we got wasn't significantly different based on um, the taxonomy of these organisms. It wasn't that some groups were included or excluded. We got enough results that we were really comfortable suggesting that this is a great attractant. It works well, it's simple, it's accessible, um, non-toxic. So as a conclusion for that stage of developing the process, this turned out to be a, a great way to get people out there collecting. The other concern that people have with data quality is not just that people can do it and that it will work, but the experts versus non-experts question. And so this again links into the protocols. With school events, um, we wonder, are we doing something as people who are involved with this project that, that helps the ants find our cookies? Are we selecting sites unknowingly and in ways that they're actually bringing things in, whereas the public does this, so they not get the same sort of samples? And the answer is no. Trained versus untrained I think we call them, uh, participants here. Basically, our technicians, our team of people who's trained to do this, versus introduction, introductory ecology students. Um, we were able to do this as part of a lab at North Carolina State University. We asked them, basically we gave them our printouts of this is the protocol, we gave them a time and a place to do it, and we saw no difference really in, in the kind of results that they got. So again, the robust protocol helps us avoid this issue of, of concerns about data quality. And then just as a side note here, it was interesting to split up between native species and observe and, um, and exotic species. We got a lot of exotics for counting individuals, but a lot more native species. And so if we're just looking at exotics in urban areas, we feel fairly confident that anybody can easily encounter them. And when it came to native species, well, that curve is still rising. We're still getting a lot of interesting native species coming in. Okay, so feeling comfortable with data collection, that we can use these data, that they're not skewed in some way based on our protocols or participation, um, we have to think a lot about data management. So um, another concern was once we get these data in, um, and I shouldn't say data at this point, I should say samples in, the basic idea of the project is a mapping project, but from the beginning I had this idea, and my colleagues and I, as we built these projects, we're very concerned with multiple stages of analysis. So mapping is one thing, but I really hope to do population genetics with these samples. Now most of the time when I collect, I collect into 95% ethanol. And so we wonder, if the hand sanitizer is good, we know it's a good attractant for bark fields, but it's ethanol in there. So will it serve to preserve DNA? Can we have people put their samples into hand sanitizer, send them to us, and will the quality of the DNA be good enough to use for high throughput sequencing? or some interesting things we might want to do down the line so that we can continue to use these samples. The answer is yes, by the way, but I'll talk about that more in a minute. And then, of course, variations in, in timing and, and, and geography. You can't ask people to collect these things in the dead of winter um, in, in northern Minnesota. Another aspect of managing the data was that we didn't want this to be a bunch of Excel sheets on somebody's home computer. And I know that sounds silly, but you'd be surprised at the number of incredible projects where that's exactly how the data are stored. And so we spent a lot of time and effort building a website that was integrated with our database. It's accessible from anywhere, where the, the workflow is streamlined enough that we don't have people just sitting there typing data in. The participants enter the data where they're collecting. The taxonomists who are doing the identification enter the data on their end and it's accessible by people who are administrators. So a lot of this has to do with working with programmers. It's interesting stuff, um, it's really complicated, but I'm very happy to take a look at those ants and then look online to see what, what their identifications are and not get handwritten data sheets. So going back to this question of data, DNA quality, are we gonna be able to use these things for, for interesting downstream projects later on down the line? Well, we took a look at some of the traditional items that people use to preserve their insects um, in the field, prevent them from rotting, and um, also what people use to preserve their, their organisms for future molecular work. So ethanol, hand sanitizer, um, high quality propylene glycol, and then low tox antifreeze, high tox antifreeze, and you know, all the things that, that we've seen in the literature. And we did this trial of basically what's gonna happen when someone collects some bark beetles, puts them in the hand sanitizer, or these other things, 
puts them in a bag to send to us, throws it on their dashboard, and then walks away for a week, and then says, oh yeah, I forgot to send those samples in. Is that gonna be anything that we could use later on down the line? And so in order to do that, we took one whole, one log where we pulled out all the samples from the same gallery, so we know that they're at the same stage, basically um, should be the same quality of DNA, all living organisms, threw them in plastic bags, duplicated it, put everything out in the sun under a shade, uh, not under a shade, but under a rain protector, and had them sit there for either two days or seven days, and then a couple of controls that we stuck straight in the freezer. And then we did qPCR to quantify not just the amount of data, but also the quality of the data. Was it basically easily amplified in that red line that runs across there? It's basically a cycling threshold. And as you can see, everything goes up pretty much all together with a couple of negative controls down there and a couple of fails, but since everything was duplicated, um, we didn't have any sample that failed on both fronts. So basically that is to say that everything turned out to have high enough quality after even after sitting out in antifreeze for seven days in the sun. So we were pretty fascinated by this fact. It meant that we could get samples in and then do some interesting work later on down the line with them. So just to be sure, we took some samples, a subset of them, sequenced them, and then blasted them to see are we getting back what we think we're getting. And it's it basically came back beautifully. Yes, we, we got back what we put in. And so this kind of testing to make sure that things were going to work well, I think has, has served us well in building this project because it means that we know what we're getting back. We're not going to be set, putting a, a huge amount of effort out there for data that we can't use farther down the line. So just to jump into the participant experience aspect, when people send in their specimen stuffs, what they're getting back is identification as the first line. So when somebody sends ants to me, we've identified them and we've uploaded the information. They can go back in and type in their address or just find their, their collection site as a dot on the map, click on it, find the species that were in their yard, <coughs> click on that, it'll take them to a page. They can learn a little bit about those ants. So you get a name, you get some basic biology. Beyond that though, we try to do a lot that actually builds on what does it mean to have that identification? What do these organisms do? Um, this book is a free online ebook by Eleanor Spicer Rice, who's at NC State University. She, she did her PhD there, and now she's a science writer. And this is something that Rob Dunn's lab has been working on quite a lot, which is really bringing people in to learning about the organisms through free, accessible online material. So we might do in-person presentations. I, my students and I go out and um, we meet with, with young people, we meet with older people, we'll meet with all sorts of groups. But we also talk a lot to the media, we also do social media, we create videos to demonstrate how to follow the protocols, and we try to do as much free online stuff as we can because it means that lots of people can access it. So when people want to identify the ants, we don't ask them to do it in order to send their samples back. But we do provide things like a cool infographic that's basically, you know, if you, if you don't recognize this, this is essentially a dichotomy. But it's a different format, and it's something that people can follow to find the 11 most common ants found in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they can identify them themselves. It's a cool educational tool, and it's just fun. It's interesting. People like it, and people are very happy to have the tool in their own hands. So this is fun stuff, but as a scientist interested in knowing, does it really work? I wanted to know a little bit more about the educational aspect of how much are people retaining from doing a project like this? Does it actually contribute to their learning? And so I've been using a class that I teach called the Insects. It's an undergraduate course for non-science majors. It fills a gen ed requirement for a biology course at the University of Florida. And I've built in these citizen science projects as an activity that's required for the course. And I wanted to know, is there some way I can measure what they're learning from participating in these types of projects? I think these students are a pretty good proxy for the general public because they are non-science majors. And I ask every year at the beginning of the course, how did you find out about my course and why are you in this course? And one of the options that they can pick is it fit into my schedule, no, I'm not interested in insects. And I can promise you I get a lot of responses like that. People are very frank. But those are, I think that's a great response because that gives me a lot to work with. So my approach has been a quantitative and a qualitative approach, doing assessments of how much people know coming in, and then using my quizzes and exams to assess how much they're learning relative to their peers, and I 
do this design where I assign some students to one project, some students to another project. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to see if people who participate in school events have a better understanding of sociality, and if students who participate in the Bark Beetles project have a better understanding of forest entomology. So I had a great study design, and I thought I would learn some very cool things about that. And let me just tell you, this amazing conclusion up here that I've drawn is that participation in one of these projects does not influence grades. Now, to be fair, we didn't have a huge number of questions on all of our exams, and I didn't even include all of the data here. But the grades were not what I saw changing. People participated in these classes, and you know, this even takes into account prior knowledge. There's really no distinction. Students will do different things depending on their levels of interest, not necessarily one particular activity. But in talking with my colleagues who do a lot of qualitative assessment, as opposed to quantitative assessment, they encouraged me to do some focus group discussions, have other people lead discussions about experiences of activities, and do a lot of things like anonymous feedback. And so throughout the semesters I've been teaching this course, I've been soliciting feedback from students and doing things like focus group discussions. And so students will say things, I'm not there, I have other people taking notes, um, they're invited to come with free pizza and other sort of enticements, and then they're asked to discuss these topics. But specifically asking about participation in citizen science activities, people said things like, this gave us a way to see how what we were studying impact our everyday life. It's a chance to participate in something bigger than ourselves. It allowed me to link course material to real experiences. Now, I don't know what that sounds like to you, but to me that actually sounds like learning or developing interest. Something like a positive experience in a class where somebody came in thinking, I'm only taking this to fulfill my requirements. So some other evidence that I found useful was that students that were non-science majors picked up an entomology minor. And out of 38, I have four students who now picked up an entomology minor in this course, which, you know, interesting. Um, and I can't say that this is entirely about my great teaching or entirely this activity. Maybe they just connected with entomology, but it's something. And then in terms of these anonymous, I give lots of opportunities for anonymous feedback, but I, have, um, I was just looking through some to see if I, could, if I could find one that really embodied what I was hoping I could do. And I did find a number of students who had positive responses, but I like this one especially. I entered the course thinking I would hate it and feel disgusted the whole time, but this class has shown me the opposite. It's more of like an exploration class, except it includes some lectures. So this is somebody who has discovered science and exploration class. This is not the dry science, that person in the, in the lab code with the flask, with a prescribed lab activity we have to do. That exploration that they're talking about are some of the activities we did, like going outside and collecting ants, or some of the activities that we did in class, like touching cockroaches. I mean, you, you guys all understand what this exploration is all about. But I've been really interested to see that people who have somewhat of an aversion to science non-science majors are very vocal about not wanting to be involved in science too much. Using other terms like exploration, observation, and discovery does actually open some doors. And so this has been very interesting and giving, has given me a way of understanding how people participate in these activities coming from an interested in science point of view or a not interested in science point of view. So the future of what my lab is doing right now involves Changing our assessments to not think about so much content that people are learning when they do a, a, an activity like School of Ants or the Backyard Park Beetles, but rather perception of science. And so we're going to be continuing to do educational assessments and learning assessments in terms of how people feel in, term, in terms of their trust in science, their interest in science, and how it impacts their own lives. And then moving beyond mapping, getting to a point where we can develop and, and really work with the data that we've we've gathered already to ask new questions. I don't want to go too long, but I want to zip through and get to some interesting results that we have so far. So I'll just mention that um, one species appeared quite a lot in our samples. It was an introduced species that I mentioned I was going to talk about later. This is the pavement ant. The pavement, the common pavement ant has been around North America for quite a long time. It turns out that it's a complex place where it comes from in Europe. Um, the pavement ant is a complex of seven species. And one species was introduced to the U.S., or so we thought. The study that originally identified that complex didn't look very extensively. Now, since this was the species that was most widely collected, it was found in 85% of our samples, so I have 500 individual collection sites of this particular species across North America, 
thought that would be a fun one to work with. There's another very similar looking, somewhat distantly related species that has been introduced more recently from Japan. And so basically this is a cool opportunity to use molecular tools to tell these things apart and see what's going on in population genetics. So already we've identified some new areas where this ant is found. So they were not known from four states previously. But then we thought, can ask some fun questions. How many introductions were there? Is it just that one species of the complex or one more? What kind of genetic variation do we see? What kind of invasion dynamics can we suss out? And are these things a good proxy for basically human commensal? They live in pavement. So anywhere that we live, where we pave our roads, these things live quite comfortably. So can we see ourselves reflected in their patterns? So we started out with a basic approach, single genes looking at CO1, um, used about 100 samples, and it turns out, well, there wasn't a whole lot of variation. In fact, there's almost no variation. This turned out to be just a single species, that species E, going back to species that don't have a name, this complex of seven, they were not named. And so we are dealing with a species here that, that doesn't have a name. Um, but we did find it four haplotypes with just a little bit of variation. We found that our taxonomists did an awesome job of separating out the newer Japanese pavement ant from the European pavement ant, um, which was interesting because they are very hard to tell apart morphologically. Um, and so good job taxonomists, way to go. But it also gives us an opportunity to really um, try to understand those dynamics of, of those two invasive species and how the, one might be, be displacing the other. But because we only had one marker, CO1, we couldn't, without a lot of variation, we couldn't really answer those questions that I put up before. And so our new approach now is ragtag sequencing. I don't know if anybody here is using that approach, but it's basically a genome reduction method. Um, and it's gonna allow us to sample about 1,000 homologous markers throughout the genome. It's not as expensive. Um, as I might have expected. It's a cool technique, and basically we're getting some um, interesting questions with a very large hammer, but in part because we can do it. We've gone ahead and, and tested to see whether our specimens that come in from school of ants with people popping them in the freezer and sending them to us through the mail are DNA ready. Do we have good enough quality DNA? And so far we do. And so we're partnering with Stu McDaniel's lab at the University of Florida, who does a lot of rat seed, in order to basically get a huge amount of data back and start really understanding population dynamics of this very common species. Okay, so wrapping this up here, I just want to point out that I think citizen science is starting on a, a very interesting trajectory right now. And I'd say over the past five years, we've seen this exponential growth of these projects. Initially, I think a lot of people did it because as a scientist, you get a lot back. Um, you get great data, and more and more people are using it as an educational tool are bringing it into classrooms, people are participating in these projects in ways specifically for education. And so when we think about young people exploring the world, having the opportunity to participate in science, I'm hopeful and fairly confident that we're going to make some great scientists. But I think it's also important to remember that there are a lot of people who might do these things who are experiencing science education who are not going to be scientists. They're going to be our politicians, they're going to be business people, and they arguably are going to be more important in our lives and future jobs and policies that, that are made that affect us than any of our colleagues as scientists. They might be the ones who are deciding what science looks like in the future in terms of funding. And so to me, it's extremely important that these people have some positive experience with science, that they understand natural history, they see how the process works, and they connect with it in a way that they can carry on into other careers. So with that, I'll thank all the people who collaborated on this. Um, School of Ants is a project that was born at NC State University when I worked in Bob Dunn's lab's postdoc. And um, since then, we've, we've been building on this project and others. And I'll also thank um, Backyard Beatles team, which is Yuri Pulser, and our students, Sidonia Steininger and Tyler Bytone, who have been really instrumental in building these projects. So thanks very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. that 
Yeah, so what actually happens when you put out those beetle bottle traps is, uh, well, depends where you are and what time of year it is, but we've gotten over 500 individual beetles in a trap in a night. So you get a lot. You don't necessarily always get the one that you might be targeting. And what that actually, what that map showed was the results of one species from this early detection rapid response program, which basically puts out these heavy duty traps, brings in a ton of beetles, and then they sort through looking for things that might potentially be problematic. And so it's kind of like the ants, you, you have a big net, and then you're starting through potentially looking for things that could be of interest. But most of the time you're either getting a lot or you're getting nothing. So the beetles are flying or they're not. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure whether the, um, the sort of cultivating and budding interest in science is your primary or secondary objective, but um, to the extent that you want to do that, and um, if you happen to attract some um, the, the kind of person who might be interested in going immediately further than just freezing and sending away, um, do you provide any opportunities for them to kind of um, come into the local um, university uh, in Florida and see and get involved in, in the PCR analysis? Or, uh, That's my goal, is to build that up. And I know at, at the University of Florida, there is a pro program for basically getting involved with high schools um, and, and providing a program where high school students can come in, intern in a lab. For the university students, it's very easy. I have a lot of students who work in my lab either as um, basically lab assistants or volunteers or interns. Um, my first line before I say come on into the lab, because that is a lot of hands-on activity, is providing ways that people can ask new questions. So this is a module that I'm working on right now, which is basically working, partnering with teachers and trying to figure out ways that people who do something like this and want to do more can develop their questions and then build a framework around that. So for example, if your question is, um, what kind of food do these like? Do these ants like best? Which one is this preferred? They could build some sort of cafeteria experiment. I'd like to work with a classroom that would build an experiment that we would then publicize that other classrooms could up the experiment as well, and then feed the data back into people who are participating. And so I would do that rather than have people come into the lab for the PCR portion of it first, because I'd like to see some hypothesis development. Um, I think that would be really cool. But um, getting to the point where I can have people in the lab and working on some of the genetic stuff, I think would be cool. Ultimately, what I would really want to do is then feed that data back out and are give you, people the opportunity to do that. And the answer is not yet. If I could just ask the follow-up question, then, then do you provide at least on the, say a website um, the, the, the sort of a flow chart of what happens when, the, when you receive the sample and, and yeah. the different stages of exploration that, that you undertake, these are the tools we use, this is what we use, these are the tests we're doing, so that at least they can they can see the, the full life cycle. What happens to that sample that they're sending in and how it's used and why it's important and all that yes. The answer, in short, is yes. Basically, what happens from the time your sample leaves your hand in the mailbox to you know, what do we do within the lab, and then until you get that email that says, hey, your, your data are up on the map, come and check it out again. And so as we're building these other units in, um, that's something I'm really excited about, is what goes on in the lab? How do we deal with these samples? And that's part of what's happening in my lab right now. My students who come in are interested in, in doing the science and basically have research-based projects but are also heavily involved in the science communication. So as they're doing their projects, part of what they are doing is narrating what they do and returning that, building it into the project, explaining the science that they do. So um, I don't think that's reflected as much on the website right now. Um, plenty in the next six months to a year, you'll be seeing more of that because that's what's actually happening right now. But I think you, you hit it exactly on the head, which is if that's to be visible and accessible, it has to be something that people can really see happening and participate in, yeah, not just data collection. Yeah. Sorry, real quick, but can you speak to startup costs? Because it sounds like you have quite a program going on. And if you know you wanted to start this and you didn't have as much to work with, yeah. what do you think the essentials are, and what um, you know how much? Yeah. So most importantly, you need uh, a website. So if that's something you can build yourself, it's not going to cost that much. If you can work with someone who's a programmer to build a, a database that's going to be that basically the repository of the data and then the interface between you and the public. So I can't give you a number, but if that's something that you you can't 
that you can do yourself, potentially very inexpensive. Um, the most expensive thing is paying people's salaries. So if you are a student and uh, this is part of your project, it's free because your time is already paid for. I, get it. Uh, I don't know if your advisor would like you to say this right now, but if this is something that you can do, I'm not sure who your advisor is or you know, who, who you're supervising, but um, it's people time. It's the time dedicated to doing these things. And part of the reason that they can work is that they're building on pre-existing either knowledge or programs. So if you are good at identifying ants, it will not take you very long. If I need to hire somebody in to my lab and teach them how to identify ants, their training is gonna be expensive. Um, and that's what's gonna happen over time is I, I have to apply the money to have people who can do the identifications. Starting up is easy, funding a program and maintaining it over time is harder. Okay. And say so, like with the number of samples you have, that might not be that easy either. You know, like so if you're really successful and you have many samples to look through. That's true. And that's yeah. Yeah, but we also work with a lot of undergrads who work as volunteers. And so we developed that infographic is basically a triage process. It takes a matter of weeks for people to figure out, do you have any of those most common ants? You know? And if, if it doesn't fit that category, then it goes into a, a separate pot, which is let's send it off to an expert. And so part of it is you're mostly, at least in our case, we mostly get a lot of very common things. And it, sorry, I was, I didn't mean to cut you no, off. Go ahead. I mean, I think that this is something I'd be happy to talk about more, but I would say that, again, if you can envision a process that are things that you could do, the most expensive part would be paying other people for their time um, if the project gets big. And then communication is the other part, which is very common. But the materials needed are usually And so with that, I want to thank Andrea and also remind grad students that there's a lunch up in 366 if you want to join us.